The Lord be with you. 169 years is how long this church, in one form or another, has been here. But I, I was first introduced to you all 10 years ago when I sent an email to, out of the blue to a, a guy named Dr. Michael, Michael Oliver, who, as I was new to the area, I was thinking, man, is there any other pastor around here who thinks like me? And Mike sent me an email back, said, hey, man, come up here and let's go eat lunch, which is a good thing. So Mike and I, I met Mike here at Williams. He showed me around the church, and I think we went back when Guthrie's was still here, or whatever it was after Guthrie's before it was a Japanese joint. But through uh, my friendship with Mike, I had found a colleague here at Williams and was introduced to this place. In fact, as you all remember, back in April of 2011, the first person I called was Mike. I said, Mike, how are you? Is everything okay? What can I do? Mike introduced me to Williams. He introduced me to the original Golden Rule Barbecue. I don't know if you remember that. And uh, said, burnt ends, I think is what you ordered, side me. So I thought, what in the world is my order? But, but I'm thankful for Mike Oliver's friendship. I'm thankful for him being here. And Mike, the clock says, it's 20 till, and they want to eat. But you know, you know that. But you do whatever the Lord calls you, Mike. Thanks, man. Thanks for being here. Chris knows that I've never worried about the clock. I know, I know y'all will, but, and we will get out of here to eat, I promise. I really appreciate Chris inviting me. I'm very humbled when he invited me several months ago to come to be here. It's been a long time, and I just want to soak you in just for a minute, if that's okay. Love you all. Mary and I pray for you. We think of our church home here at Williams often. Um, you have meant so much to us, and I can't express to you what's in my heart today. A lot of things have changed. I met some kids who were just coming up here doing the children's story uh, when I got here, and now they're driving. Uh, some of them are in college. Um, it's amazing. Some of them have babies that are meeting me in the parking lot, Ashley. Uh, it's crazy. But a lot of things haven't changed. Uh, Tyler Ponder and Ty and some other guys are still talking out in the parking lot. They'll be out there before church, and they'll be out there after church. The choir is unbelievable. Linnell, that's a beautiful job. What a wonderful, touching music that you have uh, here. It's a treasure at Williams, and I hope that you'll never forget what a wonderful thing you have in that music. Uh, I was told Marilyn I was so looking forward to her playing, and she reminded me, of course, of the grief that we still share as we think about the loss of our good friend George and the empty spot that we have here. Though we know where he is, and we know the great music that he provided for us all through the years. And other things have not changed, too. Brent Thomas came up to me earlier and said, you can do whatever you want today, but don't sing. <laughs> so thank you, Brent. I got the message, and I'm not going to sing. Uh, when I was aware that we were coming here last week or so, I, was, I called one of my friends here and said, uh, I hope that you can come uh, to be a part of the worship service for homecoming. And he said, well, I hope, hope I can. I'm going to try. And then a few minutes later, I got a text, is Mary coming? And I said, well, Mary's coming. He said, I'll be there. <laughs> and so I know you probably want to hear a little update about our family, and I'll start with Mary. Um, Mary is here. And uh, you have prayed for Mary in, in a lot of ways this last year. October, Breast Cancer Awareness Month 2018, on the first day we found out her diagnosis of breast cancer, and on the last day, on the 31st, she had uh, surgery. And then we began a year-long uh, treatments of chemotherapy and immunotherapy and all those kinds of things that many of you I know are familiar with. Uh, we had a good, clear scan on Friday. It's a year out. So we are, we are so extremely thankful. Uh, we'll meet with the, our oncologist on Tuesday. We anticipate her having some other kind of uh, medication and treatments for about seven years and scans ever so many months. So... We do covet your prayers for Mary, but that beautiful, wonderful face and my love is here and, uh, and very happy to be, be at, at uh, Williams today. Uh, Mary is working for the Madison City Schools as the uh, secondary instruction specialist, one of the biggest school systems in our state. I'm very proud of all that she does and the continued uh, impact she has uh, on children's lives. She worked at Jackson here for a long time. Andrew and Jessica go to church here, as you know, and they're both educators. Andrew works at Sachs Middle School, and Jessica's at Weaver. Our Jonathan got married, believe it or not, two weeks ago. We've added another girl to our big brood of boys. 
Sydney is just wonderful, and they live in Asheville, North Carolina. Uh, Samuel's sick today, or he would have been here. He's at the University of Alabama working on a graduate degree, a master's of business administration. And Thomas is here. Uh, some of you remember Thomas from his days up here, and now he's past me in height. He is a freshman at the University of Alabama. And I'm in my eighth year at Trinity. It's been a great experience for me there. I love the church, and the people have been so good to us, and I know you want to know that. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to tell you that I've done since I've left here is my involvement in the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship. I'm very proud of CBF and the things that we do. I was able to serve on the CBF Missions Council, and now I'm on the governing board for CBF. In the time that I served, we did a restructure of how we fund and how we support our missionaries around the world. And I wanted to tell you just briefly about that, because Trinity and Williams were one of the first churches in the state of Alabama to have that commitment. Bear Howard led your church to do that. And while we were here, we continued that great support for missions. CBF decided to look at the context of where we could do missions. We can't be everywhere, so we decided to, to work on three main areas, working with the global church, people in global poverty, and in global migration, which is the greatest time of migration that's happened in human history, is occurring now. Uh, also, we think about the kind of work that we do. We sort of identified three areas that our missionaries work toward. Bearing witness to Jesus Christ, seeking transformational development in their lives, and cultivating beloved community. And I've been able to get to know a lot of our wonderful God's family around the world because of this. And I want to thank you for your continued support for what CB CBF is doing. Uh, one of the neat projects that we have is in Macedonia. One of the things you can do is you can buy a pregnant cow. It's pretty crazy what we do. A farmer gets that cow for a year, gets to keep the calf, and then they lend the cow on to the next farmer. It's amazing the kind of creativity that our missionaries have on the field. Well, this is a challenging time. This is a challenging time to be church, and I know you understand that. Uh, I think it's probably as great a challenge as the American church has faced in our nation's history. And it's hard to be a pastor. Chris, I know you understand that. And all the pastors I talk to, we're, full, we're sort of in the same boat. We understand how difficult it is. And for clarity for me, I often go back to my calling that God gave me back in 1985 when I was a summer missionary sitting in a dry cistern in Israel of all places. My calling. And I go back to the stories that have shaped who I am today as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I think I remember telling you sometime when I was here that you ought to think about going back and writing your own story, your spiritual autobiography, how God has worked in your life. And I'd encourage you to do that. Uh, there's something powerful about trying to trace the hand of God in your own life. And I want you to know that Williams has a lot of chapters in my spiritual autobiography. This calling that I have and these stories that I have, many of which you played a part in, helps me get up in the morning to do the difficult work of pastoring the church. It helps me to give ground in a time when I feel like the church is facing so much animosity toward it and its values. And it helps me have some clarity of focus about what really matters. And this year particularly has helped me to remind myself about what really and truly matters. So I encourage you to think about your stories here at Williams. We're celebrating 169 years. It's amazing. Many, many new churches don't make it. In 1850, some people felt God wanted to plant a church here. I think Ohatchee number two. What a creative name. And I'm glad we changed it to Williams. And the church is still here and still vibrant. And I'm so proud of you for that. One of the things that I think you'll see if you'll think about the stories of your church is how many times that Williams has been faced with an obstacle, a barrier, or a need that Williams always rises to the occasion. Williams always rises and meets those needs. I remember speaking to our students at Pleasant Valley after the events of 9-11, and they, they called and wanted me to come down there, and I remember being in the lower gym and all those students and just the chaos and the complexity and the, the fear of that moment. But what they wanted was someone from the church to come. And the church meant Williams to those students. The church here at Williams always has risen to the occasion as a dependable church. And I hope that you'll remember that as you think about your stories. When I think about all these memories I have, my heart's full. I'm very glad. And so many people come to my mind. So this is the passage that I wanted to read for us this morning. It comes from Hebrews in chapter 12. And it says these words, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely. 
And let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. So great cloud of witnesses, and what a wonderful passage, really, on a day when we think about homecoming. There's so many of those people who continue to be a part of my lives. And at some point in time, we developed a mission statement for our church here called Touching Lives with, by Sharing the Love of Jesus. And that is the heritage of Williams. It's been the heritage for 169 years. I don't go back that far, but I remember some of the stories you've told me even before I got here. The, uh, I think, 1993 blizzard and the way the church responded to that event, EL allowing people to get kerosene at the store during that time, the Palm Sunday tornado, the 2011 tornadoes, didn't our hearts burn within us when we were serving and developing all the kind of ministries that allowed people to find homes again and be able to stay where they had, many of them lived all their lives. And you were all a part of that. I remember in 2007, uh, in deacon ordination here at the church, telling our deacons that we're going to be coming onto the deacon council to do everything you can to create in this church a sense of home place. Everybody needs a home, a home place where you can come to and feel like you belong and you're cared for and you're loved. And I think church should be that way. Sanctuary should be that way. A sanctuary should be a place of safety where people can come and relax. And, and no matter what you're dealing with and what you're going through and what your thoughts are and your diversity that you bring to the sanctuary, it's a place that's home for you. I remember a definition of home years ago was uh, at home is a place where when you've got to go there, they've got to take you in. And I like that. And I think the church should be a home place for people who come here to work out their salvation with fear and trembling, a place where they don't have it all figured out. They may agree or disagree with you about whatever topic. They may have troubles in their lives and barriers and a sense of shame and sin and all those kinds of things. But here in the sanctuary at home, they find people who will love them and help them find help and redemption and healing for their lives. And I think that's a long part of the tradition of Williams. Williams has always been a place that's been open to inquiry. We want to have a thinking faith. We want to think up of the great things of this majestic, wonderful God we have. I remember Lee Messer telling me early on when I got here, per capita, there's more educated people in Williams than any church in the county. Well, no pressure for a young preacher. It's a smart church. And I had to work real hard at my sermons. I thought about what to say today. And I remembered the wise words of a guy named Bob Johnston that many of you remember. Bob told me in a deacon's meeting one time, Mike, if God lays something on your heart, you can share it at Williams. And you must share it. That's been one of the most freeing things to me as a preacher and has guided me in my preaching all these years. So I want to talk to you about the, the condition or the state of the church as I see it today. It's under attack. The values and the things that we cherish as a congregation, as followers of Jesus Christ, face so many things outside of us, the family, the home place, that would divide us and try to conquer us. I saw something last week that said by 2029, in 10 years, there will be more non-religious people in America, America than Catholics. Now think about that. The church faces some of the most challenging times it has ever faced in our country. And the divisiveness that I don't think I have to illustrate for you, the divisiveness that is out there in our society, in our culture today, would do everything it can to invade the lives of congregation members. And I say it to Trinity all the time, can we not simply sit together in the home place, in the sanctuary? Can we not sit beside each other? even though we disagree about very important things in this world? Can we not still offer water to people who are thirsty in the name of Jesus, even though we disagree about who should run this country of ours? Can't we do all those things that Jesus taught us in that parable of the sheep and the goats? The sheep were feeding people, clothing people, providing presents to people who were lonely, proclaiming the gospel to preachers, to people who hadn't heard it. I know this, as he told that story of the last judgment. At the last judgment day, we will not be asked if we were good Baptists or good Methodists, or if we were Republicans or Democrats, if we were pro this or anti that. 
We will not be asked about our views of the end times. Were you premillennialist or amillennialist or postmillennialist or somebody once said panmillennialist. It's all going to pan out in the end anyway. <laughs> but we will be asked how well we loved and served the one we call Lord, Lord. How well we loved those He loves in this world. I have devoted my life to the local church. This year is my 30th year as a pastor. and Next year I'll celebrate 30 years as an ordained minister of the gospel of Jesus. And I can tell you, in the local church, we need each other. We need each other now, perhaps more than ever. I was with a friend some time ago who was at the funeral of his dad in a different county we went to, and he was disappointed at how his church, that church for his dad, had not supported his father during his illness and his death. And he made a statement to me that struck to my heart, and he said, he said, you can't depend on the church. You can only depend on your family. But aren't we supposed to be family? Aren't we in the church of Jesus Christ supposed to be brothers and sisters? You know that song? They will know we are Christians by our love for each other. Philip Yancey wrote this wonderful book about a physician in World War II who was treating World War II pilots who had been burned, deformed in their faces, though they were great heroes in the war. And they had multiple surgeries in the beginnings of plastic surgery to try to get their face to some presentable fashion. And they would look in the mirror, he said, and that mirror would tell them what they looked like. But the true mirror, those pilots said, is when they went out in the world and looked at the faces of others, would they be repulsed by their look? Or would they accept them and love them as they were? And I believe that the world has so many people who look at the church as the mirror of Jesus Christ. They don't need to see my face looking back at them. They need to see Jesus' face, right? They need to look at the church today and see brothers and sisters united not about all the things out there, but about one central proposition, that Jesus Christ is Lord of all. And in our unity in Jesus, the mirror that people see is the face of Christ. Christ who will condemn them? No. Christ who will love them, restore them, redeem them. No one walks away the same when they meet Jesus, and they should in the church too. This is the community of Jesus, and the hardest thing to find these days is a church full of people of diverse, free thinking. Think about it. After the last presidential election, studies tell us 14% of Americans walked away from their congregations. The divisiveness of our nation came in to the pews of our churches. We're not supposed to be clinging to a politician or a party or any kind of philosophical approach. We're supposed to be clinging to Jesus, right? Our culture tells us to pick a side. Birds of a feather need to flock together. But Jesus was trying to create something countercultural. Culture says uniformity matters. Vote the same, think the same, and act the same. And Jesus just said, come, all of you, come and follow me. And they did come from all the diverse walks of life, Pharisees, religious people, and sinful tax collectors, prostitutes, fishermen, farmers, rich and poor, men and women, Jew and Greek, slave and free, widows, loners. They all came to Jesus. And in our times, Auburn fans and Alabama fans... (laughs) have been coming to Jesus in the same church. I remember, thank the Lord for JSU. I remember that we, at some point in time, we said Pentecost Sunday's coming. We ought to do something for the Holy Spirit. We don't talk about the Spirit much. Let's all wear red. And some of my really good Auburn friends says, I don't own a stitch of red. And I know what you're trying to do, Mike. You're an Alabama fan. You're trying to get me to wear that. And I said, what about JSU red? And they said, well, yeah, we can do that. So we did JSU red. We do that at Trinity, too. I started that. We wear red on Pentecost Sunday. When we first moved here, we had the youth over to our house, but we still lived in Jacksonville, for the Iron Bowl. That was a big mistake. That was, I'll just tell you, that was a rookie error. But we had them over, and we went to you know, the grocery store, and, and Mary had them get a cake, half of it decorate Alabama, half of it Auburn. We didn't know that the Alabama youth told the Auburn youth that since we were Alabama fans, that we had doctored up the Auburn side of the cake. So when the day was over, all the Alabama cake was eaten and the Auburn cake was just pristine as ever. 
It's funny, but it is a divisive world. It is a divisive world that does not trust each other and has a hard time listening to each other, in particular our hearts. I was sitting at the hospital at UAB a few weeks ago, and I just heard these guys talking, simple folk, and the guy said, I ain't smart, but I ain't dumb. (laughs) It's a profound statement. He said, it's okay to put your trust in man, but we're supposed to put our total trust in God alone. Isn't that true? Trust is an easy word. It's an easy word to roll off the tongue. It's a good church word. It's hard for us. I don't know why, but it is hard for us. We turn our religion into sin management, trying to make things pure, unpure, the shame that so weighs us down instead of simply trusting the ways of Jesus, trusting what He's done for us, trusting that what He said is true, that the gates of hell can never withstand the church, no matter how difficult it seems to be to be church. Trusting that for 169 years the hand of God has rested on this church and will continue to rest and guide this church. Trusting each other through the years that must come ahead and for the pictures that will be taken and added to some album that some sweet young girl now, the youth minister, will share to her kids. Trusting in your own God story. Trusting in the ways that God has called you and trusting that God does things that we can't imagine. Finding ways out of pickles, finding ways out of situations that we thought we could never find ourselves out of. God has this uncanny way, doesn't He, to work and to wring out good of situations we thought couldn't be wrung out of. You know how I got here? You know how I got here? Some years ago, my first church in Tennessee, there was a difficult period, and I remember calling, and preachers do this sometimes, I complained about my church. I complained to Bob Ford, who was my campus minister. And he's always been my mentor, and I'm so glad Bob's here with us today. And I said, Bob, I'm so frustrated right now, and if you can ever find a church like Williams, and they've got women deacons, which is a big plus, as a Baptist, I believe women have the right to do whatever God calls them to do in the church, and you've embraced that. And I said, if you ever find a church like Williams, I want to try to go there. Well, about a year passed, and a guy named Doug Ponder called me on the phone just out of the blue. I hadn't sent my resume anywhere. I don't know if y'all knew that. Doug, Doug Ponder called. He said, well, I'm going to chair this search committee at First Baptist Williams. And I said, well, that's, that's good. You want some advice about somebody or who you're asking about? He said, no, we're asking about you. I said, well, how'd you get my resume? Well, it turned out Bob knew the church was looking for a pastor. And without telling me, he went to the BCM computers and pulled up an old resume of mine from Summer Missions. And I'm sure he fixed it up because it needed a lot of fixing. <laughs> and it got to Doug and it got to that committee. And you know how we knew we were going to come here? Now, you know, this is not the spiritual stuff. You know, the spiritual stuff really counts. But you know how we knew we were going to come here? I called the church to ask a question, and nobody answered the phone, but the voicemail came on. It was the voice of Peggy Hamby. And I told Mary, an angel works at that church. (laughs) And there's no way we're not going to Williams, right? (laughs) We're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses here. And when I stand in this pulpit one more time, with you today, I can still see them. I can hear them, and I feel them in my heart. Doug, Perry Green, Oliver Graves, Ralph and Dolores Green. Got to be a several Greens in my list. Johnny Green, and those wonderful biscuits, those rolls that she used to cook for us. So, so many. Bob Johnston. I mean, the roll call could just go on and on, couldn't it? And what made them great is a spiritual discipline, a choice to turn their eyes on Jesus, to let everything become less important than that one great thing, the discipline, the intentionality to keep their focus on Jesus. What did Hebrews say? Fix your eyes on Jesus. We used to sing a song here a lot. The Lord would lead us. You know it. The title of my sermon, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. And then Roy would get up here. And there's still a squeak. There's still a squeak. (laughs) Well, now when when the choir would do a great job singing like they did today, Roy would always turn around and get us started, wouldn't he, with the clap. Roy would ask us sometimes, 
Just say that name. You remember? Jesus. Say it again. Jesus. Jesus. Roy was reminding us of something that sometimes we can forget. Among the challenges today for pastors and for churches is to keep our eyes focused on what really matters. To keep our focus on Jesus. We can get people to come to church. People still love Jesus. They respect Him and a lot of people admire Him. We can get people to start following Jesus. The big task is to get us all to stay focused on Jesus. To let everything else in this world that would be primary in our lives become secondary to Jesus Christ. People ask us, what helped you and Mary get through this year? And my answer is Jesus. I know that sounds very simple, but it is definitely true. Isn't that supposed to be the way church is? Simple. It is simple when you come down to it. We have made it complicated. Jesus is Lord. That was a saying that the early Christians did. And they would accept somebody because they believed if you could say Jesus is Lord, nothing else about your life mattered. And you could belong to their congregations. Can't that be enough for us? Can it be enough? Can it be just that simple? Jesus Christ is our common Lord, no matter how different we are. Because isn't it His blood we still rely on for salvation? Weren't we baptized in Jesus' name? Aren't we still enriched by His teachings and empowered by His love? And don't we belong to the church that Jesus founded? The church for which He gave His life. What are we if we are not devoted to Jesus without reservation, without anything more important than Jesus, wholeheartedly, singly to Jesus? Bob Ford one time said to our group at BCM, every once in a while you need a good come to Jesus meeting. Y'all can hear Bob saying that, can't you? I can. <laughs> I can hear it. The time, the time, we need a good come to Jesus meet. When I was a kid, my favorite song, it's still one of my favorite Christmas songs, is Little Drummer Boy. My grandmother gave me a picture of a drumming boy, a little drummer. You remember that song? He comes finally, as poor as he is, and says to the king lying in the manger, I have nothing to bring you. So he plays him a song, but he really did have something. It's the only thing we still have to bring Jesus. The only thing we still have that Jesus wants from us is our lives, not our money, not our political opinions, not our skills or talents or anything else, but just us as we are. And from time to time, we must re-give our lives to Jesus. We need to come to Jesus. If we can keep focus on Jesus, I'm convinced that things tend to sort out. It's like light in a dark room when you think there will be nothing but darkness or a warm blanket when you feel like the cold is shuddering in on you. The things of this earth, our worries, illnesses, our politics, the economy, our home economies, they all grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and His grace. There's an old poem that I look at almost daily. It says, every morning lean thine arms a while upon the windowsill of heaven and gaze upon thy Lord. Then with the vision in thy heart, turn strong to meet the day. It's hard for us. We have a hard time trusting. We're hard being vulnerable. And it's hard to keep focus. I, some years ago, I have a picture. It was the back of an old Reader's Digest of a guy that's jogging down the sidewalks of some town. And he's jogging by a pastry shop and the guy has a cake and he's putting it at the window like this and the jogger's jogging and looking at it. It's hard to run forward looking back, isn't it? And that cake is so enticing. That cake that the world offers us, that cake of bitterness, that cake of divisiveness, that cake enticing us away from the simplicity of Jesus as our Lord is so enticing. But we must turn our eyes upon Jesus. We must do it for the sake of a world that needs a church to be good church. We must turn our eyes upon Jesus. How did Mary and I get through this year?
because we love each other a whole lot. We have a great family, great church and support. And we, we relied so much on our, our faith in Jesus Christ. We decided, and we weren't always good at it, but we decided to look more at Jesus than at the cancer. We decided to keep our eyes more focused on our faith in God than the illness and the pain and the uncertainties that came our way. I know that sounds simple, but that's my answer. That's what I was called to preach 30 years ago. The gospel of Jesus Christ. You remember when we developed core values for Williams and we said you could come here in the future and the people would be different. The preacher would be different. The music might be different. They might have some, something on the screen on the wall. Lord forbid. <laughs> the hymnals would change. We might have chairs. But we would recognize the place because the DNA, the spirituality of the place would be the same because the core values would still be there. And the first core value we have is this. We value our relationship to Jesus Christ who is the head of the church, the clearest revelation of God and the cornerstone of our faith. And for me, just for me, for clarity, particularly in times of stress and uncertainty, I have often gone back to my calling and to those foundational core values, the things that I believe the deepest, the things that I hope the most, and I have been able to find Jesus there because He's never going to leave us. He'll always be there through everything that we face in life. I saw a story of a woman years ago in Scotland who traveled around selling cloth and thread and stuff. And when she came to a crossroad, she'd throw a stick up and wherever it landed, whichever it pointed, that's the way she would go on the road. One day a guy watched her and she kept throwing her stick up and down several times. And he said, well, I thought you threw it up and whichever way it pointed is the way you go. And she said, well, it keeps pointing to the left and I want to go to the right. <laughs> and that's us, isn't it? We so easily put ourselves at the center, our wants, our desires, our opinions, that's okay. We all fail from time to time. So we need discipline. We need intentionality. We need willpower. We need a lot of prayers to help us. And we need each other. That's why Jesus gave us a home place. That's why He gave us each other. Not to pull us down, but to build us up. And to help us keep focus on Jesus. These are hard times for the church. And the world needs a great witness. The world needs to see a church be the church of Jesus. The church for which Jesus Christ died. Do not let anybody disparage your church. Do not let anybody disparage the church of Jesus and talk down to her. You have a great church at Williams with a long and wonderful history. And we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. And not all those witnesses are dead, by the way, and gone on to heaven to glory. You are still those witnesses. You who come here Sunday after Sunday, teach Sunday school and serve on committees and take care of kids and sing in the choir and go to Perry County and build ramps and all that kind of stuff, you are the great cloud of witnesses and you are able to present to the world an alternative if you want. It's your choice. You get to do it if you choose to care for each other, if you choose to worship God well, if you choose to stay grounded in His Word, if you choose to serve those that He loves still in this world, if you choose to be good church for each other, in short, if you choose to keep your eyes focused on Jesus. You are the reminders of my faith when I need it. And even I need that as a preacher. I need you. I need you to be good church. I need people in my life who are good church to me. You remind me that everything will be okay. Not always that everything's going to be okay, but all things shall be well. You remind me of that. Williams has done that for me so many times. If we can only remember one thing, to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, Let's throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles us. And let's run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before Him, He endured the cross, 
scorning its shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, consider him, who endured so much opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary, and you will not lose heart. I didn't have a whole lot to say today, even though I said a lot. I hope that we can all do what we can to support each other, to keep our eyes on Jesus, because simply that's all that really matters, isn't it? That's all Jesus really has asked us to be as a church. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. If I were a singing man, I'd lead us in singing that, but Brent Thomas said, you can't sing at church, <laughs> so I'm not. But please, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Amen.